Hello everyone. To understand today's gospel text, we shall review where we left off last week. You may recall in last week's gospel, we read that when traveling from Galilee to Capernaum, Jesus apparently overheard an argument among his disciples. After arriving home, Jesus had asked them about the dispute, but they kept silent. In fact, they were very embarrassed. Because on the way, Jesus had been speaking to them about his impending suffering and death, whereas they were arguing about who was the greatest among them. In response, Jesus neither discouraged nor criticized the disciples for their ambition to be great, but taught them that the greatest person is the one who puts the needs of others first and serves them wholeheartedly. And then, placing a child in their midst, he told them that welcoming such a child is equivalent to welcoming him, Christ, and God the Father who sent him. Friends, it was at this time, as we read in today's text, that John said to Jesus that he and other disciples had seen someone using his name to cast out demons. Friends, we did not argue whether demons exist or not. One thing is certain that in the time of Jesus, people believed in evil spirits and that they invaded people causing both physical and mental illnesses. The most common way to exorcise the demons was to use the name of a still more powerful spirit and command the unclean spirit to come out of the possessed. This is the type of exorcism the disciples had witnessed. They had seen a man using the all-powerful name of Jesus to expel demons, and they tried to stop him from doing so because they said that he was not following them, that is, that he was not a disciple. But apparently, they had other hidden ulterior motives to try to stop the exorcist. They regarded the man's work as a serious threat to their exclusive calling by Jesus. They probably thought that they had given up their jobs and even had left their families in order to follow him. In turn, Jesus commissioned only them to preach and cast out demons. But for whatever reason, this man was not following Jesus as they did. And yet, he was drying out demons in Jesus' name. Evidently, Jesus himself enabled the man to cast out demons and demonstrated his tremendous power. It made the disciples feel jealous, less special and important, and this led to the discussion of who was the greatest. Friends, knowing their motives, Jesus raised the issue and instructed them not to stop such people. He said that first of all, those who perform miracles in his name would unlikely also speak evil of him. That is, those who evoke his name would be his authentic followers. Secondly, by citing a proverbial expression, whoever is not against us is for us, Jesus made it very clear to his disciples that the man was neither against him nor them, rather he was just doing the same work, promoting the same interest and destroying the kingdom of Satan. And therefore, though he did not follow him as they did, in as much as he was opposing the same common enemy and did nothing against him, he ought to be regarded as one of them, as on their side. Friends, and then speaking directly to them, Jesus further said, Anyone who gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will surely not lose his reward. Friends, a cup of water is the smallest of gifts, a gift that almost anyone can give. Yet, it is precious to a person who is really thirsty, in some instances, the gift of life itself. Thus, Jesus assured his disciples that all who would make even the smallest contribution to those who are engaged in his work will have their full reward. He did not specify the nature of the reward for those who help his disciples, 
but only assured them of its certainty. Friends, then Jesus warned against those who would cause the little ones to sin. Friends, numerous verses throughout the Bible give us a special glimpse of God's love for his little ones. And the little ones has various meanings, the children, the poor, the vulnerable, the strangers, the sick, God's people and so on. However, in most places of the New Testament, Jesus' teachings refer to little ones or children imply his disciples and believers. Jesus' disciples were of course also called his servants. Friends, now let us go back to today's Gospel verse. Jesus said, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were put around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Friends, there are four things to take note of in these words. 1. Certainly, God must have a special anger reserved for anyone who would harm a little child because basically a child is wholly dependent, vulnerable and defenseless. However, in these words, Jesus refers to both his own disciples and believers, especially those who are new, weak, immature or unlearned, and thus vulnerable little ones, and for whom God has a special concern. 2. Jesus' warning of punishment is addressed to both believers and unbelievers who cause harm and hurt your disciple or tempt your disciple to sin, as well as the disciples who distract, seduce, deceive or lead astray from the truth and into sin, the ordinary young lowly Christians, such as the one who gives the disciples a cup of water and the one who carries out good works in Jesus' name. 3. Jesus uses hyperbolic language to describe the fate of those who cause the little ones to sin. Hyperbole means unrealistic exaggeration or intentional overstatement. Examples for hyperbole in modern speech include statements like, I have been waiting for ages, I have told you to clean your room a million times, and so on. Friends. Hyperbole, like other figures of speech, is not meant to be taken literally. Now, Jesus used such a language to describe the horrible end that awaits those who lead his little ones to, into sin. Jesus said that it would be better for the one who leads the other into sin to be drowned at the bottom of the sea than to commit the sin of leading a believer away from Christ. Friends, Drowning of malefactors by tying a stone or any heavy thing about their necks and casting them into the sea was in fact a punishment and a means of execution both in Rome and in Palestine at the time of Jesus. 4. Just as God would reward those who give even the smallest help to all those who belong to him, that is, the disciples of Jesus, he also would address those who do the smallest offense to all those who believe in him. Friends, lastly, Jesus made it abundantly clear to his followers how he feels about anyone attacking the children of God. Here, he employed another hyperbolic and figurative language to emphasize the importance of resisting sin and to paint a picture of hell. He said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed than with the two hands to go into Gehenna, into the unquenchable fire. And then he repeated the same refrain, replacing the example of the hand with the foot and the eye. Friends, what is Gehenna? Gehenna is spoken of twelve times in the New Testament, with Jesus using it eleven times. Gehenna is the Greek transliteration of the Hebrew Gehinom, meaning Valley of Hinnom. It is a small but deep and narrow valley outside of Jerusalem. It was the valley in which, from the days of Ahaz, the king of Judah, Israelites used to sacrifice their children by fire to appease the Canaanite god Malek. In later years, 
The valley was declared unclean and was subsequently used for burning corpses of criminals, dead animals and garbage from the city of Jerusalem. And worms and maggots fed on the refuse, parts of it were continually burned and there the fire, smoke and stench never ceased. Friends, using Gehenna as illustration of hell, Jesus told the disciples to chop off the offending parts of their body so that they can still enter heaven as opposed to going into hell with their body intact, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Friends, Jesus was not saying that the disciples must literally mutilate their bodies as a punishment for their sin, for they could cut off a hand, a foot or pluck out an eye and can still commit sin. Rather. He was warning them of the seriousness of sin and the reality and the nature of hell. He wanted them to go to the root of the problem and remove it, so they did not cause any sin. As far as the disciples were concerned, they had to confront the sins of pride and jealousy. Friends, what is the message for us today? 1. Let God and only God be the judge of people's thoughts, words and actions. Let him alone determine whether something is right or wrong. Therefore, if someone prefers not to do something our way, this does not give us the reason to stop them from doing it their way. Friends, we must not prevent those who do things in the name of Jesus. As long as they do good work for humanity, they all belong to Christ. As long as they do not speak or teach anything that contradicts the gospel of Jesus, they are not against us. They are for us. For Christ cannot be restricted to the boundaries of our church or community, as his spirit blows where he wills. Therefore, as disciples of Jesus, we must respect anyone who brings people to Christ, despite our differences. 2. God takes notice of things we do for the servants of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even if we only help in the smallest ways, we are assured of your reward. He promises to recognize every good deed we do for his sake and multiply it and reward us in due time. So, friends, we must not arrogantly overlook the needs of the little ones who bring God's message to us. Sometimes we may have to deny ourselves certain things that mean much to us. When we support their ministries, we to participate in God's mission as partners in ministry. 3. It is not hard to imagine how someone can lead us to sin. They could draw us into gossip, anger or strife, envy or even murder. Sometimes we too can be the cause of others sinning. But friends, Jesus reminds us today that just as our smallest help toward his children will be rewarded, the smallest offense against his children will be also addressed in due time. Therefore, as followers of Jesus, we must be careful about our example and influence on others. 4. Many people, even Christians, don't seem to take sin seriously. We tend to treat our sin lightly, calling it shortcomings, errors and mistakes. Friends, we catalog them into mortal or big sins, for example, murder, rape, incest, perjury, adultery, and venial or small sins, for example, lies, theft, impatience, anger, drunkenness, etc. Friends, we either think that we are not all that bad or that God's love is so great that our sins do not matter. But we are very bad. If we aren't, Jesus would not have come and die in our place. Friends, God's love is great and so also his justice and his wrath. This is why he sent his son, for his justice demanded that crimes be punished. Therefore, sin is a serious matter. It is more than an act. It is an insult to God. It is an affront to God's holiness. It demeans God's authority. Friends, all sin is sin against God and therefore infinitely serious, and sin brings about damnation, 
that is eternal separation from God and never ending torment in hell from which there is no escape. And so if the hell is real and it is terrible and if we don't want to go there then we should be willing to take every effort to avoid sinning. We should be willing to remove any person or thing for example your place, your relationship, your job that tempts us to stray away from God's will that entraps us in sin and that deprives us of your peaceful, healthy, joyful, happy life here on earth and eternal life in heaven. Amen. God bless you.